You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 89. It's important to note that the video we just watched was the second part of a longer video entitled Ancestors. The credits at the end of today's section pertain to the entire video, even the first part that we saw in an earlier episode. Now, one of the themes in social studies is that of location. In a previous episode, we used prepositions to establish sequence. Prepositions can also fix events in space as well as time. Now, when I say space, I mean location. So let's see how prepositions can establish actions, events, and situations in locations. Now, in the previous video, we saw images of Chaco Canyon. This is in a region we call the Southwest. Chaco Canyon was the center of a vast trading network and it's believed that the people of Chaco Canyon controlled the exchange of turquoise. Now the simple preposition in can tell us where this situation was located. Chaco Canyon is located in the southwest. The word in is the preposition and in the southwest is the prepositional phrase. It tells us where this civilization was located. Now, Chaco Canyon's influence was felt throughout the region of the Southwest. Throughout the region and of the Southwest are both prepositional phrases that identify the location of this dominance. Now, roads fanned out from Chaco Canyon to other cities in the region. From and to are both prepositions from Chaco Canyon and two other cities are both prepositional phrases. When the economy of Chaco Canyon collapsed, Chacoans moved to Mesa Verde and other communities in the region. Of Chaco Canyon and to Mesa Verde are both prepositional phrases fixing the locations of these events. So is in the region. So the prepositions in, to, from, of, and throughout are common prepositions of location. The preposition on is also commonly used for the same purpose, as in they planted crops on the mesas. Prepositions and prepositional phrases can help us identify where actions, events, and situations take place. In the following video, Let's see if you can spot the prepositions and identify the locations to which they point us. Well, uh, the fact is that uh, they figured there were at least four migrations. And I couldn't give you a date on the first one, um, but just the artifacts that are here tell you it was a long time ago. And uh, they, they came over and probably settled uh, as, as the ice was melting in an area that wasn't icy. And uh, the world looked a whole lot different than it does now. Just in the Columbia River Basin area, uh, there was the end of the glacier was there. And as it got warmer and the melting occurred, <clears throat> huge lakes were formed over in Eastern Oregon and Idaho. And when the, um, I guess the dam broke in the lake, it just had tremendous water coming down. They called it the Spokane Flood. But they think that there were some people living there before uh, this flood occurred. And, and of course here, uh, there have been the excavations here and out in Paisley, where uh, the archaeologist students from uh, Oregon State have been there two or three, maybe more times, doing excavations. So they keep, you know, pushing this time clock back. It's just amazing. We know that America had mammoths, and we know that at one time Oregon had saber toothed tigers. So did the first Americans encounter saber-toothed tigers? 
they possibly could have. Uh, we know that the mammoths were here, and in relation to saber-toothed tigers, I'm not sure historically where they come about, but uh, that's how they determined that the Clovis Point was used for hunting mammoths because the cache of uh, bones that they found had uh, Clovis points in them. So they knew that they were um, hunting with the Clovis point. And they really are spear points, big spear points were found with bones of the, of the woolly mammoth. Uh, here in Klamath Falls and Klamath County, the farmers are always uh, turning up ancient camel bones so camel. we knew that that camels were part of it. Um, and as far as that is concerned, I'm, I can't really tell you any more than that uh, with regard to the types of animals who were here, except we assume from the bones that were left, certainly bird burn bones, uh, small animal bones, <clears throat> and the way they were living uh, around these giant lakes, which Cougar Mountain Cave at the time was right on the edge of a huge 300-mile lake. And um, they lived in these little rock shelters that were just, you know, normally made by uh, weather. And right outside their door, uh, they had this huge lake with fish and birds and the animals came down to drink. And so uh, it was probably a I guess you might say easy living at that point because everything was here for them. And if you notice the uh, sandals that are up there have mud in them so that they would just go right out and walk in the lake and get whatever they needed. So they had the birds nests and eggs and all of those kinds of things. Fish was the mainstay of the diet of Central Oregon's Native American population. Fish were the starting place for the seasonal rounds that were made for sustaining the tribe. The Native Americans stayed here until the fish run was basically over, or they had all they needed, but they were so aware of the seasons of change and what grew during that particular portion of the year, they would know where the next gathering place was. It might be berries, it might be roots, it might be any number of things that uh, were important to them, uh, which in this case is wokus, which is the water lily uh, that grows on all of these lakes around here, which makes sense because that was their main, one of their main foods. And so they knew at what time in the fall those uh, berries were ready to be harvested.